Well, good morning. It is a great pleasure to, to be here and especially to uh, be introduced by uh, Steve Labuti. Steve is quite a remarkable, uh, quite a remarkable person, and actually has a holds a record in the uh, in the surgery branch of the NCI. As you heard, I've been the, the uh, chief there for the past 41 years. We've had one one surgical oncology fellow who came to the uh, to the branch. We have about eight each year. Uh, Steve had finished his uh, training and then uh, came to do a to do a fellowship. He's the only fellow in the 41 years that I've been there who went from the two-year fellowship onto a tenured uh, senior staff position in the, uh, in the surgery branch. It was clear how brilliant he, uh, he was, uh, even as a uh, resident, and we had a delightful dozen or so years uh, on the senior staff where we had a chance to interact both in the care of patients and in, uh, in research. Seems like many of our, uh, uh, of our smartest fellows go into uh, endocrine surgery, and uh, I'm delighted to uh, see that uh, uh, Jerry Dougherty uh, and Sally Carty, the two past presidents, were also fellows in the surgery branch. And my congratulations uh, to so many of you who have been through the group, and we just mentioned Doug Fraker as well, who is uh, one of your current uh, vice presidents. So I'd like to uh, discuss uh, new approaches to the treatment of, uh, of cancer based on immunotherapy. It's clear to everyone in this group the problem that that uh, represents in this country uh, alone, despite the best applications of surgery, radiation therapy, and chemotherapy. Last year, uh, over 585,000 Americans died of, uh, died of cancer. And so there's a desperate need for new approaches to the treatment of, uh, of patients with, uh, with cancer. And I'm going to discuss, as you've heard, this new area of immunotherapy that takes advantage of the body's own natural immune defenses to, uh, to, fight, the, uh, to fight the cancer. So I'm going to talk about cell transfer therapy, one of the methods for doing, uh, for doing uh, immunotherapy. Oh, incidentally, I was asked to uh, comment on disclosure. Sadly, I have, uh, as a member of the U.S. government, I have no disclosures to, uh, to mention. <laughs> there are multiple forms of immunotherapy, but we've learned a great deal by identifying immune T cells that can be effective in immunotherapy. And this is called adoptive or cell transfer immunotherapy, and it has multiple, uh, multiple advantages. One can administer very large numbers of highly selected cells. You can grow them in culture. It's quite easy to grow over 10 to the 11 cells on one shelf of a tabletop uh, incubator now. That's about a tenth of the total number of lymphocytes we have in our body. You can activate them ex vivo, so they go into the body guns blazing. They do not, uh, are not inhibited by the energic and tolerogenic effects that exist in vivo. Because you have the cells in a test tube that you're using for therapy, you can identify the exact cell subpopulations and the effector functions that uh, are required to see cancer regression in vivo. And perhaps most importantly, one can manipulate the host prior to giving the cells to create a, an optimal microenvironment for, uh, for the cells that are, uh, that are transferred. That's a particular property unique to cell transfer therapy because when one is using vaccines or other approaches, one obviously can't uh, substantially immunosuppress the patient. In cell therapy, the cells that are being used for treatment have been taken out of the body, and so the opportunity to manipulate the microenvironment is quite, uh, uh, is quite large. Now I'm going to spend just a, a few minutes talking about the treatment of patients with metastatic melanoma because we've learned so much about that that we can apply to other, uh, to other uh, cancers. Adoptive cell therapy, as we use it in melanoma, and as you'll see, now, <clears throat> moving into the treatment of common epithelial cancers involves the following. We excise a tumor. We have developed improved methods for identifying the lymphocytes that are infiltrating into the tumor. We call them tumor-infiltrating lymphocytes. 
that have anti-tumor activity. We can test them in in vitro assays, grow them to large numbers, and then re-administer them to the same patient <clears throat> so that the drug is actually the patient's own lymphocytes. But before we give those cells, we have an opportunity to lymphodeplete the patient and eliminate T regulatory cells, myeloid de uh, derived suppressor cells, uh, IL 10 producing cells, other kinds of uh, in vivo uh, actions that can inhibit the lymphocytes that are, uh, that are administered. And so we've just, uh, com well, completed uh, about, uh, about two years ago accrual to this uh, trial uh, that now has a median uh, follow up of almost uh, 40 months in which patients were subjected in a prospective randomized trial to either receive a strictly chemotherapy non-myeloablative regimen or one that added whole body irradiation. Uh, although there was a slight increase in objective response rates, everything I'll talk about will be by recist criteria. But notice that 24% of patients in both groups had complete durable regressions. And notice that of these patients with complete regressions, only one patient <clears throat> has ever gone on to recur. Uh, with 23 and ongoing responses. Uh, and this is quite characteristic of immunotherapy. If you can achieve a complete regression, it was true of IL-2 uh, two decades ago, if you can achieve a complete regression, they're almost always, uh, almost always uh, durable. And in fact, if you look at the survival curve of these patients that received the non-myeloablative chemotherapy alone, you can see now in all of in these patients, all of whom had advanced a metastatic melanoma with multiple, uh, with quite uh, bulky uh, disease, <clears throat> have uh, a survival rate that appears to be leveling off at three to four years, a little bit over 50 percent, which is by far the best treatment we have available today for patients with metastatic melanoma. And if we look at the complete responses I've mentioned, we're now talking out to, in that first uh, trial, uh, at uh, 10 years, we're looking at a substantial survival of uh, patients. Now, before performing this trial in 101 patients that were randomized, we had performed, we had treated 93 uh, prior patients, and so I've accumulated them here, this 194 consecutive patients with metastatic melanoma, to show that, in fact, there's an overall 23% complete regression rate, but especially notice the durations of the complete regressions. Of the 44 complete responders in this series, <clears throat> 42 of these have ongoing responses. Only two have ever gone on uh, to, uh, to recur. Let me show you four examples of patients just to make some specific points. <clears throat> the first point I will make is uh, that there's no relationship between the likelihood of having a complete regression uh, and the bulk of tumor. Uh, the analyses have been carefully done. An example in this patient who had many, many dozens of uh, liver metastatic deposits that were clearly growing with increasing deposits uh, occurring. This patient was uh, treated on day zero. Uh, you can see by one month later, almost all that cancer has disappeared, not all of it, but this patient went on to have a complete regression of disease in the liver and lung uh, that uh, is now uh, ongoing over 12 years later. It can happen fast uh, is the other lesson. You often see tumors shrinking before the patient leaves the hospital. You can see these large, sub this, uh, large subcutaneous uh, masses uh, that regressed over the course of 12 days. This very difficult patient had a melanoma in the back of his scalp and resisted multiple surgical excisions, radiation therapy, chemotherapy. You can see it's starting to turn, the tumor is starting to turn black by three weeks, but started to recur here at two months. And so we retreated the patient, and he has now an ongoing uh, complete regression over 10 years of this lesion as well as multiple lung metastases. I present this patient because he's only one of two of the 42 ongoing complete responders that has ever received more than a single treatment. All of the other patients had just a single treatment leading to, uh, to that complete regression. The cells that we give are living cells. Cell therapy is a living therapy. It's not chemotherapy, most of which is excreted in the first few minutes after it's administered. Uh, you close the belly, we're pretty much done as surgeons. These are cells which survive in the body as long as we do uh, and uh, can continue to exert uh, anti-tumor action. And finally, the brain in this last patient I'll show is not uh, a sanctuary site as seen in this patient when we're in a complete regression of these brain metastases over the course 
of uh, three months. So a preliminary conclusion from these studies in melanoma is that adoptive cell therapy could mediate complete, durable, and likely curative regression in patients with metastatic melanoma. And that led, of course, then to a logical question, and that is what do Till recognize <clears throat> that enables the in vivo destruction of this last cancer cell? And if we could understand this, can this success in melanoma supply clues to the immunotherapy of the treatment of common epithelial uh, cancers, the kinds of cancers that kill 90% of all individuals who die, uh, who die of, uh, of cancer. And I'd like to spend the rest of uh, our time uh, looking at these lessons from melanoma to see how we can apply them now uh, to other uh, tumor types. Now, an advance, <clears throat> an advance in this field came from looking at the mutations that were present in cancer to ask whether or not those mutations might be the targets of, uh, of immunotherapy. And so I know there are non-immunologists in the room, so there's just one immunologic point that I need to uh, emphasize that's absolutely critical to understanding uh, modern, uh, modern immunotherapy. Virtually all cancers have mutations. Some have a lot more than, uh, than others. But for a mutation to be a cancer antigen that is recognized by the immune system, it has to fulfill two very important properties. First, it has to be any intracellular protein. It has to be processed intracellularly <clears throat> into a 9 or 11 amino acid peptide and brought to the surface of the cell and bind to the groove of an MHC molecule, a class 1 or class 2, an HLA molecule class one recognized by CD8 T cells, class two by CD4 T cells. And so that process peptide has to particularly fit into that patient's own HLA molecules. And we know there are well over 200. It's a very polymorphic uh, system. And so even though a peptide is a protein is processed into a peptide, unless it happens to fit into that patient's particular MHC molecule, it will not be seen by the immune system. And thus only some mutations will be antigenic. And how can we figure out uh, how, that, uh, how that occurs? So again, it's an intracellular protein that's mutated, that puts a small peptide in the groove of this class one or this class two molecule, which is then recognized by the alpha beta chains of a T cell receptor. And so we developed and published about two years ago and then refined it about a year ago in, uh, in the last issue of uh, Nature Medicine, yet a further, uh, a further improvement, I believe, a blueprint for the generation of mutation reactive T cells that might be reactive not only in melanoma but against common cancers. And so uh, we use a system described in part on this uh, cartoon and here's how it works. We take the tumor and then isolate genomic DNA and RNA and do whole exome and transcriptome sequencing. And that way we identify every mutation that's present in an expressed gene uh, in, that, uh, in that tumor cell. But how do we go from knowing those mutations down to the nine or 10 amino acid peptide that is actually potentially recognized by the immune system if any of those mutations would be immunogenic? And so we developed a system that we uh, first described uh, about two years ago called a, a mutated tandem mini gene that encodes 25 MERS, that is 25 amino acid peptides containing the mutation surrounded by normal amino acids. So let me just show you in a little more detail how that works. So we identify every mutation. Most melanomas have 300 mutations. Most epithelial cancers have anywhere from 25 to 125 mutations. We identify a mutation in every, every mutation that exists in that cancer. And here's an example of one, a histidine mutation replacing the normal amino acid at this position. We then, because we know the sequence of the entire human genome and we've simultaneously sequenced the normal genome, we take the 12 normal amino acids that surround that mutation on both sides. Now note that this 25 mer has to contain every 9 or 11 amino acid peptide that contains its mutation. The mutation can be the last amino acid, and so these can be the 
processed peptide. It can be the first, and that can be the processed peptide. But every possible peptide that can be an antigen that contains this individual mutation uh, is included in this uh, 25 mark. And incidentally, we do all of the sequencing of DNA and the transcriptome sequencing in our own lab. You know, it took 10 years to sequence the first human genome. Now we do the full exomic sequencing using Illumina equipment in two days. All the bioinformatics takes about three days, and so by the end of a week, you know every mutation present in the cancer and all the sequences surrounding that the mutation. Well, what we then do is take that 25-mer, synthesize the DNA that encodes it, and string them into these what we call tandem mini-genes. We just make a full line that includes every mutation uh, as a, uh, as a mini-gene. And then, quite simply, take that, put that tandem mini-gene into a patient's own antigen-presenting cells, or dendritic cells. These cells contain all of the class one and class two HLA molecules uh, that a person expresses. And once now all these mutations are expressed in that patient's own antigen presenting cell, we just take the TIL that mediated a complete durable regression in patients and check to see whether those TIL recognize any of the antigen presenting cells that have been fed all of the mutations present in that, uh, in that patient. Now, the advantage of this tandem mini-gene approach, which is now being widely applied, is that there's no prediction binding. You don't have to predict what peptides will bind to MHC molecules. It's very difficult to do for class two and rare class one antigens. You're looking in one assay at every candidate peptide and all of the MHC loci uh, that, that those peptides could bind to that are unique to that patient are included in the screen, and you don't need the tumor cell line anymore. And this is a huge advantage because there are many cell types, breast, prostate, that are very difficult to grow uh, in, uh, in culture. But because we have every mutation that's encoded in these tandem mini genes, we can test without having the tumor cell line uh, available uh, at all. And so this cartoon then summarizes that. We take the tumor, we identify all of the mini genes, we put them into tandem mini genes that then go into the patient's own dendritic cells. We have multiple cell cultures that we test that come from a patient with a complete regression to see which genes were actually being recognized. Well, here's an example of one of the first times we did this in a patient with melanoma. This patient had 71 non-synonymous mutations, that is, changed in amino acid. Twelve tandem mini-genes were constructed, containing about six mini-genes each. When we checked the TIL that mediated the complete regression in this uh, gentleman, they recognized only tandem mini-gene one and not any of the other tandem mini-genes, each one of which were encoding six different mutations. Well, this is what was expressed in tandem mini-gene one, and here are the six mutations that were encoded in that. How do we figure out which one of the six was responsible for reactivity against the lymphocyte? Well, what we do is we take all of these six and individually back-mutate them to wild type. So when all six of these mini-genes contain the mutation, there's recognition by the T cells, as shown by interferon gamma release in a co-culture. If we take this first gene and mutate it back to wild type, this tandem mini gene is still recognized, but when we take the second gene back to wild type, now we lose all reactivity, thereby identifying this particular gene as the gene recognized by the T cells that mediated the complete, uh, the complete regression. And it turns out to be a member of the kinesian family, member 2C, it's involved in the stability of the mitotic spindle. Well, this is perhaps the most important and, to me, the most surprising slide that I'm going to, uh, to show uh, this morning. We took 25 mutations that had dramatic durable regressions uh, when their till were given uh, to them, their own cells with anti-tumor reactivity uh, that could mediate complete regressions. In these, using the tandem mini-gene approach, we identified 64 somatic mutations that were identified and recognized by those till with clinical activity, and every one of them were unique. Every, any intracellular protein 
and you can see a wide variety of intracellular proteins restricted by class II antigens, by a variety of class I antigens. Any intracellular protein appears to be able, when mutated and brought to the surface of the cell, can be a cancer antigen. And when we attack that cancer antigen, uh, we can, at least in melanoma, mediate complete durable regressions. Again, 64 different, uh, different mutations. It looks, therefore, like adoptive cell therapy mediates complete, durable, and likely curative regressions in patients with melano metastatic melanoma based on the recognition of these immunogenic cancer mutations. Now this recognition of somatic mutations, random somatic mutations of any intracellular protein, now appears to be the final common pathway that explains cancer regression from probably all immunotherapies that don't involve the genetic manipulation of a, uh, of a cell. IL interleukin-2, the first uh, immunotherapy approved by the Food and Drug Administration back in 1992, anti-CTLA-4, ipilimumab, the checkpoint modulators that are becoming uh, into use now, the anti-PD-1s, uh, anti-CD40 and tumor infiltrating lymphocytes almost weekly now. There are papers that are appearing that show that each one of these therapies is active because it's recognizing a random mutation in an intracellular protein that's brought to the surface uh, of the cell. It's hypothesis, but I think it's a uh, hypothesis that's being validated in the literature now virtually, uh, virtually weekly. Well, if this is the case, can we utilize this approach to treat the common epithelial cancers that are so deadly, uh, and of course including endocrine cancers, by targeting the unique immunogenic mutations that are expressed by that by that cancer. And so we see here a uh, study, uh, and there's a good deal of information from the Cancer Genome Atlas of the number of mutations that each cancer type has. And we see melanoma here, each dot being a patient, has on general the most mutations of any cancer looked at, probably because of the, onco the uh, oncogenic effects of UV irradiation. Second on this list, this is a log scale, so there are big differences between these, are smoking-induced lung cancers, again with a carcinogen from uh, tobacco smoke. And that probably explains why anti-PD-1, one of the new checkpoint modulators, could modulate about a 30 percent response rate in patients with melanoma and about a 17 percent response rate in patients with smoking-induced lung cancers, but have virtually no responses in the common epithelial uh, cancers. Uh, unless they happen to have a mutation in a mismatch repair gene that leads to multiple mutations in those uh, tumors, but those are quite rare. We've decided to concentrate on the GI tumors, which have uh, in pancreas, uh, colorectum, which have fewer uh, mutations uh, present. But of course, all cancers have some mutations that are potentially uh, targets for attack. Well, the first patient with a common epithelial cancer that we, uh, that we attempted this on was a young woman who had a cholangiocarcinoma, a bile duct tumor. She had had a right hepatectomy for this uh, tumor. She had uh, multiple lung and liver metastases that uh, appeared. She received cisplatin and gemcitabine, did not respond. Taxotere chemotherapy did not respond. Quite a common scenario for patients with this. She had a lung lesion resected for TIL, which we infused. She did not achieve a response uh, at all, some stabilization of uh, disease, uh, perhaps, uh, but progressed quite, uh, quite rapidly. We then used, for the first time, this tandem mini-gene approach to target the unique cancer mutations that were present in this bile duct tumor. She had 26 mutations in this lung metastatic deposit, each from a different intracellular protein. We made three tandem mini-genes to encompass all of her uh, mutations, containing about 12 or 13 individual uh, mini-genes in the tandem mini-gene. Only tandem mini-gene one was recognized, two and three were not. And we know it was recognized not only by co-culture results with interferon gamma secretion, but also in LE spot assays, where we could see uh, uh, also in co-culture 
uh, an upregulation of a molecule on the lymphocyte called OX40, which is a molecule that's upregulated when a T cell sees its antigen. And that's generally CD4 cells or helper T cells uh, that upregulate OX40. It appears as if this cell recognizing this patient's cancer is a CD4 positive cell. We then back mutated each one of the 12 genes in this tandem mini gene. And only when we back mutated this herb B2IP did we see loss of activity, thereby identifying the antigen recognized by this patient's TIL as a tumor suppressor that binds to herb B2. It attenuates downstream RAS and ERK signaling. Now, giving the entire TIL population, which contained only a small percentage of these mutation reactive cells, did not mediate a, a, uh, an objective regression. But we then isolated a culture that uh, had over 85% of its cells recognizing this individual mutation. We used that mutation to treat the patient and have now seen an ongoing regression of lung and liver metastases, ongoing now beyond two years. We just saw this patient about three uh, months ago in January, and you can see now uh, the lung lesions in an ongoing regression. This le lesion is here, perhaps a scar, it's PET negative. This one disappeared completely, this one completely. This one still has a small remnant, which is uh, uh, in, uh, undergoing an ongoing regression. And you can see these large other metastatic deposits which have regressed, including multiple liver metastatic deposits, leaving this hole slowly filling in in the, uh, in the liver. And so once again, We've now performed this immunologic analysis of the mutations in patients in 22 patients with epithelial cancers at the time I made this slide. Of those 22 patients, we could identify <clears throat> in virtually every patient mutations that were being recognized, and in some cases, multiple mutations. There were 57 somatic mutations identified from these 22 patients, again, Everyone was unique. Everyone came from a different intracellular protein. And notice this is bile duct tumors, colon cancer, rectal cancer, pancreas, esophagus, lung, ovary, breast, cervix. All were unique with the exception of one that duplicated in two patients, that is, who still recognized the exact same antigen. And that turned out to be two patients who had developed mutations to the KRAS mutation, the most common oncogene present uh, in, all of, uh, in all of oncology. And this occurred, again, in a young woman uh, who had a metastatic colorectal cancer. She'd had a very aggressive sigmoid colectomy, a partial cystectomy because of invasion to the bladder, multiple lung metastatic deposits. Uh, she uh, then had radiation therapy to the, bla to the bladder uh, resection line. Full Fox chemotherapy continued to progress. We looked at her tandem mini genes to see if we couldn't target her unique mutations. She had 61 putative mutations in this colorectal cancer. We constructed five tandem mini genes as well as peptide pools, went through the analysis. In this case, we synthesized all of the individual peptides that were present in tandem mini gene one, which was the only one that was recognized. And these tandem mini-genes recognized from two different cultures the KRAS mutation. We then analyzed what restriction element, what this is a class one restricted uh, antigen recognized by CD8 positive cells, to determine which particular class one MHC molecule was the restriction element because we wanted to make T cell receptors that we could then use to treat other patients. We then uh, took a COS cell line and took each of the six class one antigens. We have, of course, each have six class one and six class two antigens, but a very polymorphic system. We then took each one of those genes, put it into COS, and looked to see which cells that were transduced with each of these HLA antigens could be recognized, and it turned out that this patient had genes, had the T cells recognized by CW0802, 
that's expressed in about 8% of Caucasians, about 11% of patients with black uh, ethnicity. We treated this patient with a purified culture of cells that recognize the KRAS oncogene. Uh, and as you can see, the virtual complete disappearance of this lung metastases of this one, this conglomerate is now uh, breaking up. This one also regressed. After about five months, one lesion started to grow. We removed it uh, and are now analyzing it. That happened two days ago, and the patient is now uh, has no clinical evidence, uh, clinical evidence of, uh, of disease. But demonstrating that just targeting a single KRAS oncogene uh, can mediate dramatic regression in, uh, in patients. And as you can see, KRAS, by far the most frequent mutation in all uh, of uh, oncology, pancreatic cancers have 70%, colorectal uh, rectal cancers 36%. The dominant KRAS mutation is G12D, which is what our KRAS receptor recognizes. You can see that's the most dominant uh, as well. And so there are many thousands of patients with a variety of cancers that could potentially be treated with KRAS, targeting KRAS using uh, T cell receptors. Well, there are a variety of reagents that one needs to do this kind of treatment. One needs to identify the mutations by exomic sequencing. You can do that from paraffin fixed sections, so you can go back into the history of that patient. Uh, but you need T cells, and we generally get these from tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, which logically is a place one might expect to find T cells doing action and activity against the cancer, and that is inside the cancer itself. And we have to grow them from fresh tumor tissue, which is often not available or difficult to obtain because the patients we treat, all with metastatic disease, often have visceral, uh, visceral deposits. And so we've recently completed a study to see if we could find these tumor reactive cells from peripheral blood. And this was just published in Nature Medicine uh, two, uh, weeks, uh, two weeks ago, which is a system for identifying in peripheral blood the lymphocytes that can recognize these unique mutations without having to, uh, to excise the, uh, the tumor. And we enrich for these tumor reactive cells until in peripheral blood based on the expression of a cell surface molecule called PD-1, the exact molecule targeted by the uh, checkpoint modulators. PD-1 is a molecule expressed on lymphocytes that are repetitively stimulated. It's been called an exhaustion molecule. And so lymphocytes that find the tumor, expand and get activated at the tumor site, are repetitively exposed to these tumor antigens and express PD-1. And if you look at the PD-1 expression in the CD8 cells inside the tumor, you can see about 27% uh, median uh, do express PD-1. Elena Gross, a postdoctoral fellow in the laboratory, then looked to see if, in fact, this was the subpopulation that recognized the tumor. And when she sorted the cells into PD-1 positive or negative, virtually all of the anti-tumor activity were in the PD-1 positive cells. And that was true for other inhibitory markers uh, as well. And this was true for every melanoma that we looked at. If you isolated the PD-1 cells, which was about 27% of all the CD8s, you had all the anti-tumor activity. Well, that was published about a year and a half ago. Elena then went on to look at the peripheral blood of patients in phoresis specimens, but you can also do it just from a regular blood draw. Only about 25 to 3% of circulating peripheral blood cells express this marker PD-1, this exhaustion marker. If you now isolate this 2 to 3 percent of the circulating cells, they too, that express PD-1, they too contain all of the anti-tumor reactivity uh, in peripheral blood. And you can see here the PD-1 positives with activity in two different assays, either interferon gamma release or upregulation of 4-1-BB, or uh, you can do the same thing with a different uh, inhibitory marker, but not as consistently. Anti-PD-1 in every patient that we've looked at can contain all of the anti-tumor cells present in that, uh, in that patient. 
Well, once you have the anti-tumor cells, you can then use a tandem mini-gene approach, which we did in this melanoma patient, identify three different tandem mini-genes that could recognize uh, the tumor in the PD-1 selected cells. So now we have a highly purified uh, population. And in fact, when we do that from peripheral blood, we see that in this particular patient that had a durable complete regression, the identification in peripheral blood of cells that recognize filament A, a kinesian-like protein again, a DNA binding protein uh, recognized by, uh, by T cells. So we can preliminarily conclude that in fact selection of this tiny population of circulating lymphocytes from TIL in peripheral blood enables the enrichment of tumor reactive cells. They can be screened using the TMGs. And when in fact these mutation specific cells are detected in TIL, you can almost always find them in peripheral blood as well. And that's in this uh, paper just published two, uh, two weeks ago. It may even get simpler than that. Because the immune system, when it recognizes an antigen, when a T cell recognizes an antigen, what happens? If you get the flu, these viruses invade the tracheobronchial epithelium. Lymphocytes that are constantly patrolling the body recognize this foreign viral peptide that's put on the surface of these epithelial cells. These circulating lymphocytes see that antigen. They stop at that site, and this has actually been visualized. They then become activated and expand to large numbers, and then recirculate until they get back to the epithelium where they wipe out the viral infected cells, and it, you get cured of the flu, and that's why it takes about seven days. Well, that suggests that the tumor is not only the dominant site to find anti-tumor cells, but perhaps the most frequent T cell receptors in the tumor are the T cell receptors that recognize malignancy. And you can see in this 12 consecutive patients where we've simply looked at the frequency of the V beta, that is one of the particular chains of the T cell receptor that recognizes a tumor antigen. Let's just look at its frequency inside the tumor because it's quite easy now uh, to do that kind of deep sequencing of just the beta chain of T cell receptors. And in 11 of the 12 consecutive patients, the four most frequent TCRs are the TCRs that recognize tumor. And in many cases, it's simply the most dominant lymphocyte in that tumor. And so we have a rapid method, if we go four deep into frequency, of identifying the T cell receptors that actually recognize cancer without having to do any uh, of the uh, immunologic assays uh, at all. And this is a paper which has now been, uh, been submitted for, uh, for publication and is, in, uh, and is in revision. Well, we can conclude up till now that cell transfer therapy can mediate durable regressions in patients with metastatic cancer, refractory to other treatments, that they recognize somatic mutations, and identification and targeting of these mutations unique to each cancer has a potential to extend cell therapy to common cancers. Now, I'll finish in the next few minutes just by talking about two other kinds of targets because the whole uh, basis of immunotherapy uh, is for finding targets that, uh, that T cells can recognize on normal tissues without disturbing the normal uh, function of, the, uh, of other tissues in the body. And one other such target, in addition to mutations, are antigens that are expressed on cancers and non-essential normal tissues. T cells are so active that they can recognize from one to five peptides on the surface uh, of a tumor cell. And if an antigen that's being targeted is present on any normal cell, it will be eliminated. Well, there are some tissues that are not essential for life or whose uh, essential features can be uh, supplied otherwise. And one of those uh, is CD19 that's expressed on normal B cells, but on virtually all uh, B cell lymphomas and uh, leukemias. Zelegeshar from the Weizmann Institute about 10 years ago described what he called a chimeric antigen receptor by taking the combining sites of the uh, heavy and light chain of an antibody that actually recognize a tumor based on antibody binding, that is the three-dimensional structure of a cell surface protein, makes that into a single 
chain that recognizes the antigen and attaches it now to the intracellular signaling chains of a T cell, CD28 in our case and CD3 zeta. This CAR T cell can now introduce a receptor that recognizes on the basis of an antibody, not on the basis of a conventional T cell receptor. And so we use this retrovirus to introduce this anti-CD19 reactivity uh, into a patient with a widespread lymphoma. And this is the first patient ever treated with a CAR, with a CAR T cell. He was a patient who came to us, a 48-year-old male who had a non-Hodgkin lymphoma. He had received seven cycles of PACE chemotherapy, had a short response and recurred, an idiotypic vaccine, ipilimumab, uh, anti CTLA-4. He then received six cycles of EPOC-R, uh, the most effective chemotherapy. Uh, again, a brief response and then recurred. Came to the NCI, completely refractory uh, to chemotherapy for treatment uh, with these anti-CD19 CAR transduced T cells. He was the first patient to be, uh, to be treated and he's in an ongoing progression-free survival now uh, over six years. Uh, over six years later, uh, we now have treated well over 50 patients. Response rates tend to be in the 70 to 80 percent range. This is the, by many groups now, this uh, is a pre and post treatment x ray, and you can see the tumors in his axilla, the large tumors in his mediastinum, which have disappeared, large tumors surrounding the aorta. Uh, and vena cava, large spleen uh, that have uh, reverted, and the patient remains now progression, uh, progression free six years later. Marrow was replaced uh, by tumor, which cleared as well. But the price you pay is the destruction of all normal B cells because they contain the antigen. And you can see these B cells stay down to zero out for many months, whereas normal T cells recover within a, a week and a half, <clears throat> natural killer cells recover. Uh, recover as well. Well, it's another example that we're working on now that is a, an organ not essential and can be replaced by the use of the hormones, uh, and that, of course, uh, is thyroid cancer. And we'll come to, uh, to that uh, after I show you the examples that we can uh, achieve in patients with lymphomas. You can see in this patient with lymphoma, each one of these uh, each one of these dots represents a PET scan positivity, which, uh, which cleared. This is a uh, lung cancer, uh, excuse me, tumor in the lung, lymphoma, which cleared completely, and you can see the PET scan, and you can also see the large liver metastases, which regressed as well. Well, the thyroid gland can be replaced by thyroid hormone, and if we could somehow attack a thyroid cancer with T cells, and destroyed the thyroid gland, that might be a small price to pay for the treatment of a thyroid cancer that expresses thyroglobulin. And this work is all being done by Jim, uh, by Jim Yang. It's been, uh, was just recently uh, published, showing that he could, in fact, derive T cell receptors that recognize thyroglobulin. This was done by immunizing mice transgenic for HLA-A2, that is, they express this human class one antigen, they were stimulated by immunization and then in vitro to identi identify T cells that had a very strong recognition of thyroglobulin. Uh, and in fact, here it is compared to our best uh, T cell receptor that recognizes uh, MART1. And so we now have an approved protocol. We have not treated anyone yet. It was just approved uh, just a few weeks ago to take patients with metastatic thyroid cancer that continues to express thyroglobulin, and that's a subgroup uh, of uh, patients with thyroid cancer. Their eligibility, they have to be A201. That's about 50% of Caucasians in this country. Uh, uh, radioiodine refractory, uh, have a pet have a tumor that's progressing, uh, and no major medical comorbidities. So we are now looking for patients with thyroid cancer that do express uh, thyroglobulin. Uh, well, finally, and in conclusion, there is a class of shared antigens that are unique to cancer, generally unique to cancer, the cancer germline antigens first described by Thierry Boone in 1990. They tend not to be expressed on normal tissues, although some are, and you have to be uh, careful. We've concentrated on the NYESO1 TCR, and I just present our results of this showing that you can take T cell receptors, as we showed originally in melanoma and in 
uh, patients with uh, soft uh, tissue sarcomas, we can take a T cell receptor that recognizes this NYE so one cancer germline antigen and successfully treat patients with melanoma, including get complete responses. They're only expressed except for synovial cell sarcoma, which has a translocation on the X chromosome and therefore very high levels of, uh, of NYE so on. Uh, we can get responses by taking a normal cell from that patient, putting in the T cell receptor against NYE so one and get partial regressions, objective regressions in 67% of patients, including a complete regression. And I just show this, uh, these last few slides to emphasize the point that if you have a T cell that can recognize a tumor antigen, the target is not at least the anatomic location or cell of origin of the, tile, of the uh, target uh, doesn't make much of a difference. A T cell can kill a melanoma cell, a breast cancer cell, a sarcoma cell uh, equally, uh, equally well if the target can be recognized, and we see here in synovial cell sarcomas, these large masses uh, which, underwent, uh, which underwent regression. This is what, of course, kills people with sarcomas as they grow. And, uh, eliminate the ability of the lung to exchange oxygen. You can see these large deposits uh, which disappeared, as well as a primary lesion that had been uh, refractory to surgery, radiation, chemotherapy in an, ongoing, uh, in an ongoing response. And so we can add one more conclusion, perhaps, to the ones that I mentioned, and that is autologous lymphocytes that are genetically engineered to express anti-tumor T cell receptors or chimeric antigen receptors can mediate the regression uh, of metastatic cancer. And so what I've tried to show uh, in these few minutes is that immunotherapy is a modality that is now joining surgery, radiation therapy, and chemotherapy. Uh, and as you heard from Dr. Labuti, uh, is becoming, is entering now for the first time mainstream oncology. And I think we're gonna see many more uh, applications of immunotherapy for the treatment of cancer in the years to come. Well, thank you for your very kind attention. <laughs>